Good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Weathersfield Board of Education. It is Tuesday, December 8, 2020. We are holding this meeting virtual in accordance with the governor's executive order. Ellen, can you take a roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Mr. Riley? Here. Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative, Tiago Wen. Present. All present. Thank you, Ellen. Mr. Edmund, could you lead us in the pledge, please? My pleasure, sir. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America, America. and, and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Moving on to the approval of the minutes. Mr. Healy, I think you have a motion for us. I do. Uh, sure, I will move uh, approval of the minutes as presented. Second. Second, thank you, Mr. Cassio. Any discussions, questions, comments? Seeing none with a motion and second, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Thank you. Public comment. Mr. Emmett, is anyone on the phone? Uh, no, sir. We have no one waiting in the queue. All right. We had no emails this week. So moving on to communications, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the district has returned this week to the hybrid learning model uh, amidst an ongoing rise in cases locally. Um, as you know, last week we operated on a full remote model in order to allow those who traveled the opportunity to test prior to returning to school under the travel advisory guidelines. In addition, the week of full remote instruction also allowed us to avoid close contact situations leading to quarantines. The district received word of a total of nine positive cases over yesterday and today. And with the remote learning model in place, we did not have to quarantine any students or staff members as the result of these cases. Just want to let everybody know that the COVID-19 dashboard is up on our website. It's updated on a daily basis. Um, at this time, as of this afternoon, we've had a total of 76 positive cases in the district. 60 of those 76 were student, 16 were staff. Um, again, in terms of quarantine, we've seen a large reduction in the number of individuals quarantined. We're down to 48 students in quarantine and 15 staff members quarantined. I would say that some of those staff members who are quarantined are quarantined as a result of close contact with other family members or other folks out in the community, not exclusively through contact in the schools. Again, I do want to give a special shout out to Clover Browski, who is uh, really good about updating this data on a daily basis. In addition to Clo, our uh, colleague Charles Brown from the Central Connecticut Health District, uh, who we talk to now on a daily basis, as well as our school nurses who uh, field uh, information directly from parents. Um, so we're going to continue this um, dashboard so that you can see how we're handling things over the course of the district. Um, one of the things I can tell you is we have seen um, that infections are not related to school settings at this point in time. It has tended to be uh, family gatherings and spread from within families. Um, again, it's something we're monitoring very carefully, but in talking with Charles uh, Brown, he uh, lauds us for our mitigation efforts and uh, recommends that we continue to work hard to uh, maintain consistent mask wearing to make sure that we are maintaining uh, strong social distancing and again, keeping those hands washed. I certainly will say also what we have seen over the past month, uh, as we've seen the number of cases rise, so have we seen an increase in the number of families who have opted for full remote learning. 
Um, when we were getting ready to embark upon our broader uh, full reopening at the beginning of November before uh, the numbers really spiked, we had approximately 15% of our families opting for full remote. As I speak to you this evening, the latest figure that we have is 33% uh, of our families have now opted for full remote, uh, given the strong uptick in the number of cases. So this will be data that we continue to monitor moving forward. Um, obviously, at this point in time, we are uh, deep into uh, the, the peak of phase two of this uh, outbreak. In talking with Dr. Matthew Carter, the state epidemiologist, uh, we meet with him on a weekly basis at a, a state conference call. Uh, he anticipates that uh, we will reach the peak uh, of this uh, phase of the outbreak by mid-January. Uh, the other good news, obviously, is that it appears as if a vaccine is on its way. From a standpoint of the school district, uh, educators are going to be vaccinated uh, in phase 1B. So the state will begin with phase uh, 1A, which will be uh, health care providers, uh, health-based first responders, and nursing home residents. Beyond that, uh, in 1B, it will be educators. Um, so the community knows. I did submit a list of all of our uh, critical employees encompassing all of the Wethersfield Public Schools as well as Corpus Christi, and also Creck Discovery Academy and Creck Soundbridge. So the state has a number of uh, critical infrastructure employees across all of these educational uh, entities so that when the vaccine does roll out, uh, we will be prepared um, to be able to administer it. In talking with Charles Brown this week, we also uh, talked about the potential of utilizing space in Wethersfield uh, for a uh, vaccine clinic. Um, certainly our Wethersfield High School, uh, the grounds uh, is conducive to that. Uh, at this point in time, it is not even at the planning stage, but it's certainly something that we would work as partners with the CCHD uh, to offer up space uh, to assist in getting employees here in the town of Wethersfield vaccinated. Um, we have a couple of approval items uh, this evening. Uh, just want to let you know, uh, we have two calendars that will come before you the proposed 2021-2022 and 2022-2023 school calendar. We also will bring before you this evening the proposed Board of Education meeting dates for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, Want to make sure I let members of the public know with regard to quarantines. Um, you may have heard this past week, the CDC came up with new guidelines around the number of days of quarantine dropping the number of days from 14 to 10 or seven days with a negative test. Um, the CDC also stated that the best number of days um, is 14. At this point in time, the district is going to continue with the 14 day quarantine until we get more definitive guidance from the State Department of Public Health. We expect that that will be coming out within the week. So right now, uh, should we have any cases that would require quarantine, we're going to stick with the 14-day quarantine period, which is uh, what the state has recommended. Um, this evening, Mrs. DeStoli and Ms. Harris will be providing an overview of the district's plan for addressing snow days for the current school year. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, for this year only, the state has allowed us the option to be able to forego snow days in lieu of a remote learning day. So uh, Mrs. DeStoli convened a committee uh, and came forward with some recommendations as to how we will approach snow days for the 2021 school year. Again, the state guidelines are only for this year. Uh, and then next year, the expectation is we would re revert back to just our standard snow days. And I'd finally like to let everyone know uh, on tonight's agenda, we have an upcoming meeting, a special board of education meeting slated for Friday, December 11th at 1230 p.m. I just want to note that that meeting has been canceled. And with it, that's communications. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. You're welcome. Doc, I have two questions to ask Michael. Uh, you can during board comment. Moving on to action items. Mr. Oh my, Michaels, uh, you have a motion for us? I do. I move that the Weatherfield Board of Education approve the 2021-22 and the 2022-23 school year calendars as recommended by the calendar committee. 
Do we have second. a second? Thank you. Second. Any comments or questions? We went over this at the last meeting. All right, seeing none, with a motion on the table, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Michaels, you have another motion for us. Yes, I move that the Board of Education approve the attached proposed schedule for regular Board of Education meetings for the 2021-2022 school year. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Paradise. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, with a motion on the table, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes, thank you. Moving on to report and discussion items. Mr. Emmett, snow days and remote learning presentation. Yes, I'd like to uh, turn the meeting over at this time to Mrs. DeSoli and Ms. Harris for a presentation. Great, just give me a minute here and I will share my screen. Wrong button there. You're Sorry good, that. Sal. Sorry about that. It's trying to hit the wrong button there. Okay, is everybody good? We can see it? Yes. Well, great. Sarah Harris and I are excited to be here and to share with you um, Weathersfield Public Schools plan for converting weather related closures or AKA those snow days into remote learning days. Um, so first of all, we want to uh, have a shout out to our committee members. Mr. Emmett already talked a little bit about how we put together a committee. Um, administration, myself, Sarah Harris and Neil Takor worked with representatives from the Weathersfield Federation of Teachers. Um, along with a representative from the Para Secretary Union um, to look at the state recommendations and to bring forward recommendations to Michael um, as the superintendent. So those recommendations we share with you this evening. So a big shout out to the, those uh, members of our staff that joined us for some after school meetings and had some really, um, really robust conversations about the complexities of um, snow days turning into remote learning days. So as Michael shared, the State Board of Education approved a motion to allow superintendents um, at the local level to make decisions about snow days and turning them into a remote learning day, um, which really is a logical progression to the work we've been doing with hybrid and remote learning already. So one of the things to note um, in the State Board of Education's recommendations um, is that closures to weather's um, are not required to be uh, snow days or remote learning days, I should say, um, but they're are really up to local uh, decision in consultation with local officials in that decision making process. Um, and it is for only the, the school year. So Weathersfield Public Schools will be actually taking the first two uh, weather related school closures and making those into traditional snow days. Um, these two days will be made up in June. Um, past two uh, snow days, um, any further closures could be considered uh, remote learning days. And in most cases, if they're a mild storm or appropriate for a remote learning day, um, Mr. Emmett will designate them as remote learning days at home. Um, so students and staff will be working from home with the exception of if we had blizzards, ice storms, um, heavy wind, um, any reason where our staff or our students would have power outages um, or reasons where they couldn't engage on that remote learning day, those would be called um, our traditional snow day. So we may have more than two traditional snow days, um, but we are looking forward to really piloting um, and trying out what this um, kind of new snow day might look like into remote learning day. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about the teaching and learning part. So as uh, Mrs. Gistoli and Mr. Emmett described, um, we anticipate that this transition will be seamless um, given the experiences that both our teachers and our students and really our entire Weathersfield Schools community have had um, over the past nine months um, with remote learning. Um, as you know, our, our teachers and students spent all of, all of last week um, teaching and learning asynchronously um, in a remote environment. 
Um, and our goal with developing the snow day plan um, was to make sure that, that that plan looks really virtually the same as our remote learning plan that we already have in place. Um, students and teachers on remote learning days when there are snow days would continue in a synchronous schedule that's already aligned with our hybrid or remote learning model. They would follow the regular school day schedule so it will feel familiar to both the students and to the teachers and staff. Attendance will be taken as on any uh, given school day. Um, and all students would be expected to complete the requirements of the remote daily learning plan. So expectations would remain the same. This is, next slide, please. Um, as far as other considerations, we do we did recognize that that um, extracurricular activities will need to be addressed if we move into a remote learning day um, due to snow. Um, they may continue if they are remote, uh, but all in-person extracurricular activities would be canceled. Athletics would be decided on a case-by-case -case basis uh, by the superintendent in consultation with our athletic director. Um, and for the safety of parents and guardians, as well as our Chartwell's employees, um, the Weathersfield Public Schools will not offer breakfast and lunch on inclement weather days, um, regardless of cancellation or remote learning. So regardless of whether it's a traditional snow day or a remote learning day, um, that, that will not be offered um, for the safety of our community. Um, a snow day is intended to limit student movement to and from school when conditions are deemed unsafe. Um, and so a, a district snow day in the form of a remote learning day, should we have one this year, will remain a work day for faculty and staff. Um, and the superintendent will determine and communicate the location of work um, for each staff member um, should that uh, day arise this year. And so uh, as our, our community is aware, um, we have offered uh, te technical support to our families, to our students, to our staff um, over the past nine months as uh, we started with distance learning in the spring, moved to our hybrid model this fall, um, and of course have had students and staff members um, teaching and learning remotely at various times over the last several months um, this fall. Um, and so we, will, we would plan to continue this uh, similar support model this would be available for students and staff. We have an email address set up. We have a phone number um, to ensure that technical support is available. All students have district issued devices um, and we have platforms and applications set up for remote learning that we've been using over the past several months. So again, really we anticipate that this would just be a continuation an extension, if you will, of the remote learning plan um, in which our students and our teachers and our staff members have been participating over the last several months. So in closure, we have to remember that we're actually living through a major historical event. Um, I look forward to talking to my grandchildren about, I can't believe I lived through that pandemic. And we can't underestimate the impact of the pandemic um, on all of us, our children, our staff, um, our entire community. Uh, many experts talk about the, there's three pandemics, the health pandemic, the economic pandemic, and the racial pandemic. Um, snow days have always had a special memory in New England um, and uh, in a time that everything is very new and changing, we want to make sure we bring back a little bit of normal. So this uh, model here of having two traditional snow days before we go to remote learning days as a pilot opportunity to learn and see how well it will work um, is really a compromise. Um, it allows um, students to really get it in play uh, in the snow and enjoy that day. Staff uh, have some traditions also on those snow days, um, but also it helps us continue that learning um, throughout the winter and keeping our pace with our learning and our instruction. Um, that's such a valuable time of keeping our youngsters engaged in, in the learning process. So um, we really had robust conversations at the committee level, um, looked at different districts, had a lot of um, really dug deep into the decision-making process and believe that this model really is a compromise between um, a few snow days, but also remote learning days um, to continue that learning. And as a reminder, those remote learning days would not be made up in June, but any traditional snow day would be made up in June as an additional school day. Any questions? Just Sally, I have one. Um, I think I heard this correctly. I just want to be sure. If we have a um, remote learning day for snow or bad weather, whatever it may be, we've lived through all that here. Um, are teachers, Mike, going to have to go to the buildings or will they teach from their homes? How will you? I just didn't want clarification. I wasn't sure how I heard that. 
In most cases, Lane, uh, it would be teaching from home. I think that's, okay. that is the default is from teaching from home. We do okay. have some staff members that would prefer to come teach in the building. They may have small children. Um, they may have poor internet service, a lot of different yeah. reasons. Um, and so we recognize that there may be times um, with the unpredictable weather of New England that there may be an opportunity to come in the building, but in most cases, the default is that they will be uh, teaching from home. So we're going to be pretty flexible if they contact you or Mike and say, I'd rather come into my classroom and you'll just just this case by case deal with it. Yeah, it's all weather dependent. Okay. But we have told, yeah, I've told staff just to plan on teaching from home like the last five days. Yeah, yeah. Sally, you were referring to staff. At, I, I got the same confusion as Elaine. The staff at the end, you were referring to school staff like secretaries and whatnot. They'd be assigned, they'd be told where to go on those days, right? I, I, that's, yeah. I believe, where the confusion came. Yeah, me yeah. No, they would all correct. Our 12 month employees that work uh, 12 months. Um, and so different groups would be notified by either the building administrator or the superintendent. But the default, again, would be that they would be working from home. And then um, we would notify them if they were going to work in the building. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Yeah, yeah Chuck. Glasser? Thank you, Chuck. Um, Sally, thank you. Uh, Sarah, thank you. Appreciate all the effort from you and the committee that went into this. I have a couple questions. One related to you looked at other districts, wanted to know kind of what other districts are, are doing. And two, if we get four or five snow days for the year, let's say four, obviously two would be traditional snow days under this proposal and two would be remote uh, learning days. Do, did we get any input from teachers? Maybe there was a teacher or two in the committee, but any input from teachers maybe on how they felt about that? It's probably going to be a limited number of remote days on a traditional amount of uh, snow days we get a year again, maybe one or two, uh, what the feeling was from staff on that. So yes, I, yeah, I think that's ahead. a great question. Um, I think it uh, I think we're learning as we go along, right? I think these last five days of remote learning at home uh, really kind of gave us a window into that. Um, so I think it's really teacher dependent. I think all people are excited about trying the remote days, but I think it really varies. Um, uh, staff that have small children at home, you know, will their daycare be open? What will that look like? Um, there is a worry, what happens if I lose power and I can't teach remotely because of the weather? Um, you know, so I think it really varies from person to person. I think in general, um, a lot of people are interested in continuing because we are so flexible. We came off five days um, of working uh, remotely the last five days. And, you know, we firmly believe that instruct continuing our instructional time now through the winter months as we have greater momentum is probably going to be better use of our time than in June when the weather is beautiful and people want to be outside. Uh, and hopefully we have more vaccinations and people are, you know, possibly socializing more, or, or the world might look a little bit different than it does now. Um, so I think that there is support, but there is some apprehension. Um, and that's why, you know, in some ways it's a pilot because it has been approved only for this year. And we will be looking for some feedback from our members. Um, but I'm really optimistic because the last five days um, have occurred fairly seamlessly, not perfect. Uh, classroom teachers would prefer to be in their classroom with more tools and resources to be able to teach from. Um, but have really been flexible over the last five days. And your other question about um, other districts. Um, so I surveyed about six or seven other districts and it really varied. There were a few districts that were not using the remote um, learning days for weather closures. Um, some of those districts did not have the one-on-one -on -one technology like we do. Um, some districts are not doing the remote learning days because they believe snow days are, are again, a tradition and, and we shouldn't take those snow days, uh, turn those into learning days. Um, some districts are doing the first two days as remote learning days. The rest of them will be traditional snow days. Other districts are doing the exact opposite. So when I surveyed district, there was a mixture of, um, of everything as you can imagine in New England when it's local control that typically happens. And we found a, a wide range of um, different opinions across districts. Got it, thank you. Ms. Granada, did you have questions? No, I was just going to make a comment that I like the idea of having two snow days. There's something nostalgic about living in New England and you have a snow day and your sons sleep until 11 o'clock and then they're out in the snow for the rest of the day. They're, they just remember those days. Um, so I'm glad we're trying to keep two. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Evans, you're on mute. 
There you go. It. I got it. Okay, just um, trying to help you. Um, yeah, I'll echo uh, Bobby's sentiments because I look at my little infant and I'm like, I wonder if she'll ever get to know a snow day. Um, but I will say that I like, um, it, it is important to remember that all of this is kind of fluid. And so I like how you pointed it out. And it's a good example of the leader leader model too. It's just kind of getting a bunch of people and saying, okay, what's what, what should we start with? And I just, um, uh, I really applaud all the feedback and all the thought that mm -hmm. went into kind of trying this out and let's see if it works so and I love that we saved a snow day or two so hopefully we'll actually get some snow this year not too much just enough just a little bit Michael just a little bit yeah from a logistical standpoint uh, I did want to interject that um, obviously with the two snow days up front what that would do for us in terms of the uh, end of the year um, right now we are slated to uh, finish the year on Thursday, June 10th. So assuming we had two snow days, uh, that would wrap that week up. So we would finish up on Friday, June 11th. Um, obviously, another one of the things I'm going to be bringing before you relatively soon um, is going to be setting the graduation date. Um, that is on the horizon as well. And right now, if we set the graduation date on uh, June 10th, that's Thursday, that's a problem for us because assuming we were able to get back to the cove, back to the tradition, um, that's the day that the DMV stays open late. So that certainly would not work. Um, the other thing I just wanna make sure people are aware of is um, once we get to the point where we're getting into remote learning days, the process of how I announce those is gonna change. Um, so for me, it's gonna become a little bit more cumbersome. Um, you know, and typically when we've got a snowstorm coming in, I'm looking at it three to four days out in preparation. But if I'm calling a remote learning day, I'm going to have to call that in advance. I'm not going to be able to wait until, you know, 3 a.m. the day of the event, because I've got to make sure that students and staff have what they need on the way out. So, you know, when we get to day number three, um, obviously there's going to be a little change in the, uh, the communication uh, moving forward, but we'll certainly get that information out in advance. Thank you, Mr. Amit. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, Mr. Cassio. Um, this is to the superintendent. If you find that once we start doing the remote and you're finding it a little difficult to plan ahead and the teachers are finding it, you know, uh, quite a chore, uh, would we consider going back and just do complete snow day? Yeah, it's going to depend, John. At this point in time, I wouldn't uh, tend to do that unless we had a storm that was significant to the point where we had significant power outages. Um, as Sally had mentioned, this is a one year only deal. So I'd like to see this process through this year. Uh, and then again, next year, I'm anticipating we'll likely be back just to typical regular snow days. Anyone else? Mr. Stoli. Piggying back on Mr. Lesser's question, were, there were three teachers on this committee? Correct, we asked uh, the executive board of the union uh, to recommend three teachers to represent uh, the te teachers union. Uh, and we also asked the uh, parasecretary uh, union for the same um, to represent their membership. Great, thank you. Cause I do know there are some districts who just blanket announced that they were doing this without any input. So I think it's great that you guys got input from union and I appreciate that. Thank you for all your hard work, Mr. Soli, Ms. Harris on that. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. But Chuck, can we put that um, presentation on the website? Would that be appropriate for people to read? Yeah, it's on the website. Anyway, it'll be part of this, this meeting. But yeah, okay. it can be up there. We can put it up there. I just think it's important for people who want to read it. You know, they have kids. They get Sometimes you have to read things more than once, you know. So I, I don't know if it's appropriate, but Mike would have to make that decision. No, and, he'll, and I'm sure Mr. Emmett will send home a letter stating yep. that this is what's going to happen, especially yep. as winter's hitting upon us. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yep. Good suggestion. Thank you, Elaine. Anyone else? All right. Moving on to uh, announcements and information. Please check your packet. If you can't make a committee meeting, please let the chair of the committee know. Meetings held, facilities and maintenance, 12-7-20. Mr. Cassio. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, last night we had a great meeting, a lot of good conversation, and we had uh, gotten a, the status of our facility study. As uh, individuals recall um, that we had completed phase one and two 
of uh, the plan to look at our district. Uh, phase three was put on pause uh, and the board felt at that point, uh, we wanted to uh, see what was going on with the funding and the budget because we were looking at approximately $60,000 up to or more to uh, estimated costs for phase three. So um, at this point, um, the outcome speaks for the budget. It was not in the 2020 budget. However, uh, we've had discussion last night that we were gonna look at the reserve fund to see whether or not there would be funds in that particular account for the facility study to continue to go forward on phase three. So with that being said, uh, the committee uh, basically um, gave thumbs up to have the superintendent to research and move forward to the phase three development uh, for the community. So that was that complete update. And then um, we had a facilities and maintenance update uh, from Sally Katz. Uh, and COVID has been the prime mover for our schools regarding uh, HVAC and ventilation and what's working and what isn't working. And at the end of the day, we uh, are in pretty good shape with regarding the ventilation in our schools. Um, however, there is a long plan, long term and a short term plan, uh, and seemingly they're costly to, uh, re with regards to our upgrades of our ventilation program in our schools. Um, we're all aware of the Hamner boiler and it's in need of repair and it hasn't been replaced since 1966. And some of you were not born in 1966. <laughs> so... With that be, we are, uh, some of us were born prior to that. So uh, they're looking at that. The good news is that the burner was replaced at that school in 2015. Uh, Sally reviewed with the committee, the CIP projects, uh, which included the three roofs at Highcrest School for complete replacement, carpeting and flooring, uh, and the portable classrooms, plus the roof at Charles Wright, flooring at Hamner and district furniture replacement. Uh, one of the positive things, not something that we would like to continue is that with districts that were uh, renovating, we were able to um, collect some of their unwanted furniture to bring into our district. So that isn't something we want to continue to do, but the replacement cycle did work uh, for that moment. Um, one of the things that I think people may take for granted or not, but our custodial staff uh, has been working long hours to continually keep our buildings clean. And a shout out needs to go to that staff. Um, they are in there cleaning daily and uh, keeping a good job as Mike reported, the cases are not transmitted within our school. Uh, full remote learning, uh, the Wednesdays uh, are being tip top shape. So a big shout out goes to our custodial staff um, at this point. Uh, one bit of uh, situation that has happened, Sally did indicate that the town has not received any COVID funds from relief funds to help offset our budget costs. So the committee was present. Any other committee members that like to chime in, you're welcome to uh, let us happen. John, I'd just like to say something, um, and especially referring to Sally Katz, when she gives her report, she gives a very detailed report of what she's been doing in the schools, but it also reinforces the idea these schools are old and she's putting the best band-aids on them that she can. But she's like the advertisement for, um, for our new schools. And phase three, if I'm correct, is to refine the projects that we pick. Am I correct? And that's yeah. what the for. Correct. Okay. Um, any other comments from any other committee members? No, thank you, Mr. Cassio, very thorough. You're welcome. 
Moving on to meeting schedule, the meet, special board of education meeting on 12, 11, 20 at 12 30 was canceled as Mr. Emmett indicated. There is no unfinished business. Public comment, Mr. Emmett, has anyone come on our phone? No, I have no one in the queue, Mr. Carey. Thank you so much. Moving on to board comment. Any board members wishing to make comments? Elaine. Um, Mike, I have three quick questions. Um, you said that we're up to 33% full remote. And um, I walk the track every so often and I look at that building and I don't, I'm just wondering in each building, if you could send us how you did what's before. And yeah. I don't know if it's updated, but can you send us what the amount of kids are? It was such a small number in that high school then, but if we're at 33% now, I, it, can, is that possible to send us a chart with how many kids are in a building again? Can yeah. you update? Absolutely, I'll send that out at the- uh, No rush, I just, I'm just i just curious because I walk over there and it looks so deserted. Um, yeah, we had, um, Elaine, just to let you know, I was at Hanmer yesterday and for cohort one, we had 64 kids physically in the building. Yes, I, I you know it's very small now because, I, and I'm just curious if you can, Mike, don't rush on that. Um, yep. I have to, I was asking Matthew Kazaka on this one. Um, when teachers are out, Matthew, um, where are we, are we just using their pay scale and paying them day by day if they're out, let's say your daughter was home and you had to be home with her um, for the 10 days, how are we just paying their daily rate or are they just including their paychecks like always? You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to understand if, if there's a different their, check for being out with COVID related problems. Right, if they're using their accumulated sick time, it's paid at their daily rate, but there's okay. also a COVID authorized rate that's a lesser dollar value. Okay. And it dep depends on the situation and the circumstance. Okay. I just was curious on that one. And um, Michael, are we, or Sally, are we having, um, I have a couple nieces that teach in every, other districts and they're having trouble getting, and you've seen this in Hartford, of course, the social workers walking door to door trying to get the kids on. Are we having the trouble with kids logging on? Like I see the social worker walking with her bag through the Hartford streets saying she had a thousand homes to tell kids you got to get up and get on when this class starts, you know? Are we having that issue, Michael or Sally? Do you see it or is anybody repeating it to you? Say, oh, Lily, Lily, it's a class of three. I'm getting up to teach a class of three remotely, you know? Yeah, I don't typically, know. typically what happens, Elaine, is we'll have the cohort that is physically in the building and then we'll have the other students that right. do. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard, you know, at the high school level, there are some kids mm -hmm. who will, will get on, engage, and immediately turn off the, um, the camera. <laughs> My um, son. Don't know if <laughs> physically there or if they've rolled yeah. over and gone back to sleep. Um, you know, we do obviously um, look at engagement. Uh, and again, engagement, I think it's kind of subjective. Um, you know, for some kids, they are engaged the entire time. Other yes. times you'll find that kids will, you know, will disengage if there's a parent at home. And look, I'll tell you right now, Elaine, the, the challenge that our parents have faced over the course oh. of the past, you know, eight months, um, has been immense. So um, we do monitor, we do send data into the state on a weekly basis with regard to those who are engaged or disengaged. Okay. Um, obviously we have a full complement of social workers and psychologists. So those kids who are disengaged are ones that we're looking to, uh, to connect with. And okay, that, that's all I wanted to know. Do we have a plan to yep. connect with those that are not? And for those students with, with special needs, you know, in some cases we've opted um, to have them come in four days a week. Yeah, uh, I see again, I walk. One guy brings his kid in every week and he waves to me every time I'm at walk. <laughs> so I said, oh, well, Mr. Kazar has a, has a full group there. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Elaine? Questions. Yeah, thank I, you. I, Ms. Granado. Um, just early on, Michael, you were um, talking about the uh, staff being vaccinated in part of plan 1B. Is that the entire staff? Does that mean you and Sally and everybody and janitors and yes. everyone like that? And yeah. they give you a timetable at all yet? No, no. not at this point in time. Bobby, I'm anticipating probably sometime in the early to mid spring at this point. Really? Well, on Facebook, they had a had a thing for you guys. You're you're really early, Michael. The the educators in a chart like thing they had of the first group and the second group was the educators were in group one. And it was like January through March, I think, Michael. 
Yeah, and but I, I, who I, knows if that's authentic either? It was on Facebook, you know. I, I do want to say also that even within the structure of the school system, uh, we're going to look to prioritize our our employees. To me, you know, if I compare myself versus a classroom teacher, I'm saying the classroom teacher gets it first because the classroom teacher is on the front line. The paraeducator, lunch aides. That's to me, that's where the priority lies. And I sit at the Stillman building and yes, I have my mask. Um, but in terms of my tendency to be more closely involved with classrooms, it's not as strong. So for me, it would be prioritizing classroom teachers first and foremost. And again, at this point in time, it is, it is not a mandate. I'm not understanding it to be a mandate, but, uh, you know, talking with numerous teachers over the course of the past several months, um, you know, I think it's something that folks are really interested in. Hmm. Anything else, Ms. Granado? No, that's it. Thank you. I have yes, a question. Ma yes, Mr. Cassio. Um, I just wanted to add to the uh, facilities and maintenance uh, report that we were joined by Mayor Mike Rell as well that came to the meeting last night. So he got a full update as to what we're doing with phase three. So the communication is great. Um, and that was developed with Chuck and Mike to, to get the meeting pulled together for him to join. So, you know, we're, we're trying to be transparent and make it happen. So I just wanted to make that part of the record as well. I have a question for Mike uh, Emmett with regards, are we, and maybe it was already said and I just missed it. Uh, are, are we going to go with a holiday schedule like we did with Thanksgiving on returning back from the Christmas break? Yeah, good question, uh, John. At this point in time, I haven't made a decision as to what we're going to do um, with regard to the week after. Um, there are some districts that are actually considering looking at the week, uh, the week of the 21st, 22nd, 23rd and making those full remote. Um, I certainly uh, want to have a conversation with Charles Brown, see where our uh, positivity rate is before we make that commitment. The other piece I wonder about also with now the state being at a, what I believe, 8.6% positivity rate, I do wonder if the governor is going to ultimately press the pause button following the Christmas holiday. So, um, you know, obviously, John, my intent would be if we're going to make an adjustment to the schedule again, we would let folks know in advance. So it's not gonna be something I'm gonna spring on the community the day before, but it is definitely something we'll take a look at. And again, the other piece too is remember, we were getting ready to broaden our reopening. Uh, that has not left our minds, you know, especially pre-K, K and one, our early learners, you know, as we see these numbers hopefully peak and begin to come down, how do we get additional learners into our buildings is going to continue to be a priority. So I just, I, I don't want people to think that we have forgotten about that broader reopening. It is still on the radar screen. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You, Mr. Les Mr. Lesser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a comment and two questions. The comment is about the career advisory board or it's more of an update. We met last Monday, November 30th, which was our final meeting of the year. And we, uh, are doing a lot of things. We've had a few lunch and learns recently that's virtual, that students have really benefited and we're getting uh, feedback from the students and certainly can share that with you next time and bring that. And that in April, we are planning a career fair. So anybody who wants to be involved in that, uh, virtual at this point, but um, we hope to have 50 to 60 different careers represented. And then my two questions revolve around the remote learning. And let me first say to Sarah and everybody else who's been involved, that outstanding job, just amazing what you've been able to provide for the students. So when following up on Elaine's question, it seems to me anecdotally that we have a lot more um, kids remote at the high school and we have a lot more kids in elementary school. My daughter, who's a high schooler, tells me there's one, two, three kids in her class. And I also have a friend who teaches at the high school. And he tells me today, for instance, he had two, three, and three in three of his classes. So uh, I don't know if that's kind of what you're seeing, Michael, that it's pretty stark difference between the elementary and the high school with the middle school somewhere in the middle. Yeah, absolutely correct, Kenny. Uh, as of today, from what I understood from our admin team meeting, uh, high school reported that we currently have 571 students at the high school who are full remote. 
So that's essentially about half. Uh, at the elementary level, it's not nearly as, as large. Uh, the percentages are much lower. Uh, as Elaine had requested, I got that information out to you by the end of this week, but definitely at the high school. And I think, you know, one of the things, you know, in talking with, with some parents, uh, when we have had to quarantine teachers, um, you know, we've struggled with the idea of being able to get substitutes. So what they've done at the high school is they have utilized the calf or the, excuse me, the auditorium, and they've spread students out in the auditorium and had one individual there overseeing the students while the students were using their Chromebooks. Um, and again, I think for some students it was, well, here I am, I'm coming into school. I certainly can't have my traditional lunch where I can, you know, kick back with my friends and all 10 of us gather around the table. And here I am sitting in the auditorium. I can be just as well served with my technology at home as I can be here in the, uh, in the auditorium. So we think that's another one of the reasons why that coupled with the fact that I've had to unfortunately send out a lot of communications recently over the past month. I mean, from, you know, weekends and, and during the week. Um, so we've definitely seen an uptick and you'll notice yesterday, the vast majority of the student cases were high school based. So we're seeing that other districts are saying the same thing. You know, I had a colleague today at our Hartford Area Superintendents Association that said the same thing. <clears throat> High school, a large number, full remote. Middle school was kind of middle of the road. And then elementaries were pretty well subscribed and not a lot of remote learners at the elementary level. Thanks, Michael. And I'm glad to see that we're looking into going back for our early learners first. Um, because I think for a lot of reasons, they probably need it. And we're seeing more of them in school than we are in high school. And my last question, and maybe Sarah, you can help here. Um, I know that we've tried to, or we're planning to make Wednesdays a little bit more robust in terms of the learning. Um, I'll tell you again, from a high schooler's perspective, because that's what I have at home. She has advisory in the morning. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes. And most of the day is done after that for her on Wednesdays. And I know there's been some discussion and some parents in the community asking us to try to make Wednesdays a little more robust in terms of remote learning day. Just wanna know where we are with that and have we made some progress as far as Wednesdays? Uh, so I know that Mr. Emmett and Mrs. Gisoli can can add on to this. Um, so they, those conversations have been ongoing. Um, I know it looks different at different levels, um, but certainly the conversation is looking at the transition um, at, at some point um, to a synchronous Wednesday remote model. Um, and I don't know, Mr. Emmett, if you'd like to add anything additional from your conversations with principals. Yeah, we uh, had charged the principals with looking at ways to uh, kind of add something to those Wednesdays. I heard through uh, a couple of meetings with the WSPC that um, the meetings are, or the, the Wednesdays are not as um, robust as they'd like to see. Now, with that being said, we had some members of WSPC that looked at Wednesday as, hey, that's my recharge day as a parent who's, you know, a quote unquote teacher as well. Um, so the principals are working on a, a plan. Obviously for us, it's gonna be a shift in the way we've, we've done things. We wanna make sure that we provide ample notification to teachers. Um, again, I think one of the things too at the high school level, the high school talked about you know, maintaining it as asynchronous and continuing to offer office hours. And there again, can I have heard you know, where teachers have said the office hours on Wednesdays are immense, they're great. I'm filled up, you know, for my entire afternoon. And I think in other cases, it's just, you know, you do that 10 or 15 minutes of advisory time and then that's it. And I think it depends upon the learner. Some learners are really, you know, are self-starters and others, others crave that level of schedule and that level of, you know, I, at this time we are on, at this time we are off, at this time we are on. So principals are working on that at this point in time. We hope to be able to move that out soon after we notify our teachers of this. Great, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome. Ms. Evans. I'm mute. I just wanted to piggyback on that real quick because the last time I mentioned the Wednesday in my perspective, I got a ton of emails from people saying thank you um, because I feel like all parents don't wanna say, no, we don't want more for our kids. But um, I, I mean, I have a first grader and a fourth grader and um, I, I, I like the pace of 
of the Wednesday. Could you add more? Yes, but it really, I get a lot of work. I mean, I have to work at home. They get to do things. They meet with their, at their level, they, any extra help that they get, those sessions are happening on Wednesdays. So that's nice to have too. And um, just the feedback I think is mixed too, because parents that work out of the house um, with these small kids that have to be monitored and helped, it is a nice little breather to say, okay, you're gonna go work on this project for a little bit and then we're gonna take a picture and send it. So um, just my two cents and some of the feedback that I heard. It's not, I just, tomorrow's Wednesday and I'm like, all right, I could do this. <laughs> I could do this. It's true, it's emotional. Thank you, anyone else? Mr. Riley? I'd like to, um say that I appreciate having the uh, four days on for uh, special needs uh, kids because I think that's uh, critical for their uh, learning experience. And I also wanted to say I appreciate all the uh, communication we've been getting and the, uh, you know, the snapshot of uh, the absences. So all of that has been um, helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tiago. Oh yeah, I just want to comment quickly on the uh, the state of Wednesdays. Um, for many at the high school, it's seen as like a like a recharge of our batteries and uh, a way to connect with our teachers for extra help. Um, but I could definitely see um, implementation in the uh, elementary school where potentially more elementary schoolers might need some more uh, in class time and whatnot. So I could see uh, both ways. Thank you. Any other board members? Mr. Emmett, we had an email ask us today about why you include remote learners in your communications about testing positive. Can you explain a little more background on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when even if I have a remote learner, I have to assume that that remote learner may have friends that that remote learner may have socialized with. And um, again, it's giving everybody in the community pause to think of, okay, where was I from a contact tracing standpoint? And again, you know my, my adage when it comes to maintaining the confidentiality of our students and staff, I am adamant about that. But I think it's important to make sure that the community knows that it is student spread. Um, you know, again, our colleagues over in Avon recently had to go full remote for two weeks as the result of a social event that had such a wide ranging impact on the contact tracing. Um, so even if our students are full remote, um, we make it a point to make sure that we communicate out with the community because we know that those individuals, they do socialize. I also have to say too, Chuck, I, I got an email recently from a, a neighbor um, in the community uh, concerned about the fact that on you know, some of the off cohort days, students were congregating at houses. So that was one thing we said to principals, just to continue to remind everybody to be diligent about being careful about social distancing and limiting the amount of uh, interaction we're having socially outside of school. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I think none. Michael, uh, oh. Wait a minute. I think Michael, just going to comment on Michael's. I think it's great to be that transparent, Michael, too. I think everybody should know as much data as you can include. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm supporting what you do present to people. Well, and again, I think the idea of just, you know, being transparent about it and the reality yeah. is this, we're, we're going to be north. The whole new world. Thursday, we're going to be north of 800 cases in this town. So that is a significant increase. And I think it's important to, you know, as I, I get this information either from parents or from the Central Connecticut Health District to get that message out. And again, Absolutely. you get the same resources again and again and again. I think it's critically important to continue to remind people for the mitigation strategies, yes. for the resources that are available. So thank you for that. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Good night, thank everybody. You, Good night, everyone. Stay safe. You too.